As a fisherman, I make my living on the coast. So when my son told me about protecting the coast, I thought he was going to tell me to stop fishing. But I finally went to one of them meetings with he and it opened my eyes. Terms like climate change, storm surge and beach erosion had me so confused. But Junior showed me that when we got a storm, we lose a bit more of the beach and how developers, locals, tourists and the fishing community all have to learn to use the coast without damaging the coast. If we don't do more to protect our coast, we could lose everything. Like Freddie and Junior, there are many who rely on our coast for their livelihood. The Coastal Zone Management Unit is working to sustainably manage our coastal spaces by mitigating the impacts of climate change for generations to come through updating the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. From monitoring beach levels, restoring mangroves and wetlands, to working with community leaders and private developers, the CZMU is planning for a safer and more resilient coast. See more of Freddie and Junior's story on the CZMU and GIS social media. Play your part to manage and protect our coast, our home, our future. To view the updated ICZM plan and learn more, visit coastal.gov.bb slash ICZM plan. Good evening, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you on behalf of the director and staff of the Coastal Zone Management Unit to the second in a series of meetings which make up the public inquiry for the draft integrated coastal zone management plan. This evening, my name is Alison Wiggins and I am the team leader for the unit uh, in terms of the preparation of this plan. Let me hasten to say that we are really encouraged by your participation and we certainly look forward to a wonderful meeting here this afternoon. Let me introduce our team here this evening. We have our director, Dr. Leo Brewster, our deputy director, Antonio Rowe, our project manager, Ricardo Arthur, our coastal planner, Fabian Hines, our coastal information systems manager, uh, Ramon Roach, and our technical officer, uh, Shamari Cave. The team, our consulting team, it's headed by Mr. Raul Medina Santa Maria and the team leader from on behalf of the consultants from Camp Tabria is Mr. Jonathan McHugh, as well as Maria Moreno, as well as Heather Barker. We look forward to hearing you and to receiving your comments on this um, on the plan, and we encourage you to start sending in your comments um, through the entire entire consultation. We really look forward to hearing from you. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce the chairperson of the public inquiry, Dr. Yolanda Aline. She's no stranger to planning, physical planning in Barbados. I ask you to end, listen to her words carefully. Dr. Aline? Thank you, Alison. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this second public consultation on the draft Barbados Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. As many of you or all of you are aware, the areas either side of the land sea interface are zones of intense activity. Um, it is estimated that more than half of our population and nearly 95% of our tourism related infrastructure is embedded in that area. So it's very difficult to manage our coastal areas in an island this size, not understanding that those are areas of intense activity and without recognizing the significance um, of the impacts of land-based activities from the upper reaches of the watershed all the way through to the coastline on the one hand, and the changing intensity and in the use of our marine space on the other hand. So the integrated coastal zone management process is very essential to Barbados as healthy oceans and coastal areas are, are vital to our economic future. And this draft Barbados integrated coastal zone management plan is a timely intervention and it is looking at the, in the context of increased climate change and disaster risk and combined with more coastal development and intense use of our marine areas. So now is the time for our residents to really get involved in, in this process in a coordinated and integrated management of our coastal areas, because we, the general public and key stakeholders are all custodians of the coast. And this consultation process is an opportunity for everyone to get involved. 
As I said before on the previous um, meeting, I hope that we take, you have some of you have taken the time to read the draft plan, but even if you haven't, I want you to listen carefully this evening to whatever is proposed as policy tools and guidelines for the management of our coastal areas and to give meaningful and constructive feedback on how we can support or improve what is provide or provide alternative options to what has been put forward. So I hope that you encourage you to take notes, clear your thoughts and put in the chat what your queries are, your concerns are, or what your, your endorsements are for what has been put on the table. And I look forward to a very, very productive interaction this evening and a meaningful session. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much, Dr. Aileen. Let me remind you participants that we're here to discuss the sub area, which is between <clears throat> Concept Bay and uh, I've lost my strain of thought, which is between Kittridge Point, uh, Point. Kittridge Point and Concept Bay. That is the area we're going to look at. But however, Dr. Brewster, who will be coming next, will give you an idea what this plan is basically saying. He's going to give you a broad introduction to what this new plan and what our new initiatives are saying about the coastal um, areas of Barbados. Dr. Brewster? Thank you, Alison. Uh, good evening to everybody. Once again, I'm, I will try and look to, to provide the storyline as to how we got to where we are with the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. Now, the first plan that we ever developed was in 1995, where we looked at the West and South Coast predominantly as part of the feasibility and pre-investment studies. And we compiled all that information into a report that was supposed to help guide a process for us to get a better understanding as to where we were then. In 1998, we then went on to look at the East Coast study where we studied from Maycox Bay around the Eastern Seaboard to South Point. And we also looked at the recompilation of the data that was collected for the West Coast study. We documented a lot of information on reef locations, reef health, et cetera. And we then try to identify the priority areas that we as the Coastal Zone Management Unit consider to be essential for integrated coastal zone management for the island. We also looked at the division of the coastline into the eight sub areas that you will be hearing about over the course of these consultations. And since then we've used this subdivision of the coastline as a means of affecting different aspects of our, our work programs and activities. So now we get to 2021, where what we've done is, while in the past we looked at the integrated nature and the cohesive nature of the coastal zone management process, it became apparent that we had to look to try to integrate climate change adaptation and disaster risk considerations into the process that we are now uh, embarking on, given the changes that have taken place over the last uh, two decades or so. So the reason for the update of the plan is that we observed that the impacts that we have found as part of the coastal studies taking place within the Coastal Risk Assessment and Monitoring Program focus on issues speaking to coastal erosion, flooding, tidal variation, and tropical storm activity affecting the coast. We also had to give considerations to new approaches to protecting the natural assets of the coastline, we had to look at new modern management delivery models to assist with the better management of the coast. And we had to also determine a delivery model that would be effective for presenting coastal risk um, management undertakings and understanding the procedures that would have to be then integrated in infrastructure development. All in all, it clearly showed us that in order to have a climate risk resilient uh, coastline, it is not a simple task and it requires a lot of additional consultative activities <clears throat> being led by us. The differences between the two plans are in essence, the 1998 plan was a three report plan where we had a policy framework, we had a plan for the Atlantic coast and we had a plan for the Caribbean coast. In this new plan, 
we have two physical documents where the policy framework guidelines document has been expanded to integrate the climate change considerations into the policy rollout process. We've also within the integrated coastal zone management plan comprehensively presented all of the information and research that has taken place over the last eight years to come up with the management strategies that we think are gonna be most effective for the long-term development of the plan. The plan spans from 2020 to 2030. It also focuses on prioritizing areas of, of essential activity that the Coastal Zone Management Unit has to do in the short, medium, and long term. And there's also focus on improving the capacity of the Coastal Zone Management Unit to integrate climate change considerations into the coastal management process. The intended impact of the plan is to focus more closely on the island system management approach, which we've always done, but it's more so to look now to see how climatic impacts impacting the coastline can have um, not only the impacts inland, but more importantly, the coastline as well. It focuses on the relationship to protect coastal resources and uh, look at the unit's role and remit in terms of how we evaluate coastal development applications. And it also focuses on the identification of boundaries for the coastal zone management area to be comprehensively within the coastal zone management area space and also the zone of influence both on land and from the shoreline, from the sea that can impact that coastal zone space. In essence, if you wanna look at it, we're at the point where we have to, to weigh the costs of, if we don't do anything, what would result? And we've seen the growing impacts of climate change and its impacts on the Caribbean region generally. And it's clear that mitigation measures have to be developed and agreed on at the policy level to ensure that the climate, the coastal zone management plan can be rolled out and have an interrelated nature with the physical development plan, which is an essential document for the overall planning and development of the island in general. We have to also look at the issues affecting potential inundations, which can be also impacted by storm surge and terrestrial flooding. And we also have to look at what critical infrastructure falls along the coastline and within these uh, potential high risk zones that will need additional activities um, for enhancement at the end of this process. In the long run, we, we have six key outcomes that are coming out of the plan. We're gonna be looking at sustainable socioeconomic development being achieved. We want to see the coastal resources are protected and efficiently managed. We want to see that climate and disaster risk adaptative capacities are strengthened. We want to look to ensure that the integrated coastal zone management process is delivered through a coordinated, coordinated governance arrangement. And we're trying to ensure that the capacity of ICZM delivery is strengthened for all the relevant sectors, not only just the coastal zone management unit. Above all, research and understanding and knowledge and outreach will continue to be increased over the years and our role and function in achieving that is, is being highlighted. I think with those guidelines, that provides the foundation for how the plan is going to be effected. I would like to encourage the public to continue to take part in these consultations and, and to go on our website and read the plan and provide their comments to the office because we need to have the comments to integrate into the process as the chairman has indicated um, for the, for the full-fledged delivery of this product. Thank you very much, Alison. You're welcome, Director. I haven't seen any questions coming in as yet. Remember that you can use the bottom at the bottom of your screen, the question and answer button, and you can ask your questions there and we will provide an answer to your questions. If you want us um, during the question and answer session to um, include your name, please let me know. Or if you prefer for us not to call your name when we are read the questions, just let me know as well. At this point in time, I would like to introduce the, um, Jonathan McHugh, who is going to do a quick poll at this point in time. Jonathan? 
Thank you, Alison, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to speak to you all. Um, we're going to make this uh, an introduce a, a little bit of an interactive session for all attendees, and I'm pleased to see we've got a, quite a healthy number of attendees this evening. Uh, just before I embark in the um, three separate quick presentations to set, uh, set the scene. So first of all, we'd like to know who's present with us. Uh, their, their knowledge of coastal zone management planning and their background. So you will start to see some uh, questions coming up on the screen. And the first one you'll be able to see, we're just looking for very quick answers. So you'll be able to click on the correct uh, the, the answer that adapts to yourself. So the first one is, are you aware of the current ICZM plan for Barbados that was written by Hal Crow in 1998? It's a very simple yes, no, or uncertain. So if you can give a, uh, your answer to that, that helps us sort of couch the, um, uh, the impressions of how we're going to um, sort of promote the, the angle of discussions today. So once you've given some answers, the team will be able to present the results to give us an idea of the, um, the answers. And for this evening, we're seeing that we've got a 60% uh, knowledge uh, and 40% um, have not um, been aware of the plan. Okay, we'll take that and move on to the second, the second question. So this is focusing on, have you, have you reviewed the draft updated 2020 plan that we are presenting to you this evening? It will be an interesting analysis to, based on the 60% of people that are aware of the, the 1998 plan, just to see how many of those are au fait and reviewed the, the latest plan. So give me a score as to number one, uh, I did not know about it. Number two, I know of it, but I haven't, I haven't I really had the opportunity to review it in any de detail. Or thirdly, you've been superb attendees and you've thoroughly read the document. So you've got one of three choices there and it'll be good to sort of get people's perspective on that. So we'll analyze the results. And we've got half of our attendees saying they're aware of it, but haven't, haven't reviewed it. Um, a third of us have reviewed it in some detail, which is, uh, which is positive, which leaves uh, the, the remaining 17 that aren't aware of it. But as the director said, we are announcing that this is online and hopefully you'll be encouraged after the presentation to learn more about the details. Our third question is looking more about yourselves. And I would like to sort of get a, a rough idea as to how people find the coast of interest. So are you um, interested in the coast for your personal recreational benefit? Secondly, do you live on the coast? Or thirdly, that your business relies on healthy coastal resources and the protection of those coastal resources. So give us your perspective on, um, on that. This is obviously a, like a, a valuable exercise to sort of get a, a general stakeholder perspective. And we'll be undertaking this eight times to get a, a general um, outcome feel. So we'll analyze those results and we will present the findings. We've got quite, a, quite a, uh, an equal spread here of 38% using for personal recreation, just under just under a quarter of you living on the on this coast on the coast, whether it's sub area two or, or another another area, and over a third of you are, are heavily reliant on a on a healthy coastal environment. And our final question is relating to yourself and what type of stakeholder you are. So we're interested to know if you are um, just a, a member of the the general public whether you are working for the private sector in, in the country, 
Thirdly, whether you're working within a public institution, or fourthly, whether you are part of a non-government association or potentially academia would fall under that bracket. So select one of those, and that gives us a cohort of uh, tonight's, tonight's attendees. And what we'll be doing is we'll be sort of gathering these, um, these results. And when we come to the question and answer session, it'll help us to sort of dictate um, some of the answers back to, to everybody. So the analysis of these results um, will give us a flavor of tonight's audience. Uh, majority of us are working for public institutions and um, probably about a, just under a quarter general public private sector, and a couple of attendees from NGOs. Excellent. Well, listen, what we will do is we'll, we'll take, those on, um, take those into consideration. Um, now I'm going to be uh, uploading my presentations, which will um, identify um, the way forward for the next 25 to 30 minutes. But the following presentation is designed to ensure that we're all on the same page with regard to the global and regional significance of climate change and how this manifests itself in terms of more localized disaster events that may present themselves in this or other coastal sub areas of, of Barbados. And as you know, our dialogue these days has regrettably been overtaken by COVID-19. However, this pandemic is not and remains not the only global threat that, that we face and it's running in parallel. And that is that the climate risk continues. And your, client, your island nation, along with many other countries in the Caribbean basin, are small, but the region is particularly large, particularly in its diversity and its historic contribution to global economic wealth. In fact, all Caribbean nations perhaps need to see themselves as predominantly large ocean states as opposed to small island developing states. Because Barbados, for example, has a, an exclusive economic zone that's 424 times the size of its terrestrial space. So you're truly more blue than you are green. But with reference to the climate story, which is this first presentation, you as Caribbean people are therefore at the forefront of this planetary threat. Your communities, your businesses, all remain acutely vulnerable to the dangers of rising seas and other impacts that are accelerating with climate change. And this is constituting a real risk should global average temperatures exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial le levels as is being predicted. So at a regional scale, the Caribbean Sea is the second largest sea in the world. And as you can see on the slide, your region spans the expanse of water from South America mainland to the southern tip of the United States of America. And you live in one of the most active tropical cyclone regions of the world. And you are facing increased health challenges as a result of climate change. So the, but the main focus of, of this presentation is to stress that powerful tropical storms and hurricanes, damaged reefs and fisheries, worsening droughts, and sea level rise are all threatening the natural defenses of your large ocean state, as I state, stated earlier. And this is forcing Barbados as a nation to navigate a new reality. And I'll come on to this issue in more detail very soon. But latest projected warming trends of between one degree and five degrees Celsius are being predicted by the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. And this year, it has been confirmed by the increasing frequency of heat waves being recorded within the region, particularly during 2020. In fact, latest predictions from NOAA are suggesting that the 2021 hurricane season is to be above normal, with six to eight hurricanes and three to five major hurricanes being predicted. And in addition, and linked to these climate factors, scientists are prompted to state that dengue fever and other mosquito-borne illnesses may increase as climate change worsens. And it's known that Barbados has been experiencing these health risks at first hand. For Barbados, as well as other Caribbean nations, a common challenge being faced relates to the need to safeguard not only their people, but also their national critical infrastructure. 
To this end, the economic functioning of the region is at risk. For example, there are 129 airports and airstrips that service commercial airlines, transporting you efficiently and effectively around the region. There are 172 seaports, each containing ports, jetties and wharfs that help to distribute commodities and goods that are held within container terminals. And there are also 131 energy related facilities in, the, in place in the region, including coal fired power, power plants and oil refineries. But with spe spe specific reference to Barbados, much of its critical infrastructure is located within the coastal zone though the spatial footprint remains relatively small. So Grantley Adams International Airport land cover, for example, extends to nearly 1.2 square kilometers, whereas the Port of Barbados is approximately 0.7 square, square kilometers, with other energy facilities covering far less of a, of a spatial coverage. There is incessant pressure globally, however, to continue with a business as usual state of affairs meaning that all built assets, whether they're critical or not, should be defended from, for example, flood risk. However, everything cannot be protected by the adoption of hard engineering solutions, because the cost of this globally would be astronomical. In fact, adaptation costs in developing countries, currently estimated at 70 billion US dollars per year, is expected to reach up to 300 billion dollars per year, by the end of the decade in 2030. So as um, Dr. Brewster uh, implied earlier, the CZMU over the last 20 years have been studying the effects of climate change on the coast of Barbados. Their work as part of the Coastal Risk Management Program in summary concludes that a series of key climate related hazards must be managed in an integrated manner if any ICZM strategy or plan is to be effective and successful. So in addition to hazards such as oil spills and terrestrial flooding, these can include the hurricanes, as I've mentioned earlier, or tropical storms, storm surges, landslides, coastal erosion, and sea level rise. And in addition to that, tsunami wave inundation should, not, uh, should also be embraced as a possible high impact, low frequency hazard along the coast. So awareness of these hazards alone does not, however, immediately mean that pending disasters on the coast will occur. And this is an important point to raise. This is because a natural disaster only occurs where humans or nationally important critical infrastructure assets that support human occupation and livelihoods are jeopardized and subsequent lives are at risk. And this is the heart of a risk resilient ICZM plan. And I'll, I'll focus here on, as I mentioned earlier, on Grantly Adams International Airport, um, as actually it's an interesting case, quick case example. And this is because adaptation planning depends heavily on what magnitude of a specific hazard, be it coastal erosion or sea level rise, is to be expected in, in any specific area. For example, we, if we consider sea level rise scenarios of 0.5 metres or 2 metres, this is only a potential issue if the topography of the land is low lying and hence cannot prevent pl flood inundation. Here, the slides are, sh are showing that actually the impact is there's negligible difference between the two sea level rise scenarios at this location. Hence, the risk to the airport's functionality is significantly reduced. This, however, does not mean that this outcome is the same further along the coast. And I'll discuss this matter in a bit more detail in, in the next presentation. So the climate and disaster story therefore needs to be understood in totality. And it's this which the revised ICZM plan is at the center of. As can be seen in this slide, society depends on, on the effective functioning of a range of sectors. And these can be seen as different colors, notably yellow for financial, brown for infrastructure, blue for social services, and green for natural resources. And these sectors are all faced by a range of risks, including those relating to tourism, which could be asset or finance related, national development, such as manufacturing, health, education, or social service related, or it could be cross-cutting risks. 
And you'll see that coastal and ocean resources fall under this latter category. And hence the whole ICZM planning process, which has been communicated to you this evening, is critical in playing a, a major role in delivering a, finance, a sustainable national planning outcome for Barbados. This slide aligns the same identified sectors against the key climate hazards identified to you earlier, namely increased temperature, changing rainfall patterns, but perhaps most key to this evening's talk relates to the change in extreme events such as hurricanes, storms, and sea level rise. And the core hazards that um, require immediate high priority attention, you'll be able to see is painted as red. So the revised ICZM plan therefore recognizes the importance of taking a, a holistic approach to an adaptation and resiliency in order to respond to the impacts of climate change. In fact, Barbados is already pioneering this concept through its Roof to Reef program, which embraces a range of natural, terrestrial and coastal resource types. And this represents a valuable sustainable development model that's being adopted for the next decade or so, which has already identified at least 1 billion US dollars worth of integrated projects across sectors such as housing, energy, waste, and the water sectors. And so it really does represent a truly transformative approach to, to lasting climate resilience. So what do we mean by these coastal resources that I've mentioned earlier? Well, these can include the list that you can see on the screen, and they include cultural resources that are specific to Barbados, such as Ragged Point Lighthouse. They can include valued seascapes, such as the East Coast from Barclays Park to Bathsheba. Though more commonly, they're understood as being coastal habitats or ecosystems, such as beaches, coral reefs, wetlands, or coastal cliffs and caves. And protecting coastal resources, therefore, needs to be a national priority. So our next poll is devoted to capturing the key message of this presentation and the outcome result that will help to provide and confirm the methodology that which has been adopted in the creation of this revised coastal zone management area, which I'll talk about in the next presentation. So you'll see on the screen a new poll, and I'd like you to give your perspective on this topic of uh, coastal resources. And you will see when you uh, scroll down that you have five different, um, co si sorry, six different coastal resource types. And what I would like you to do is to rank them. You would place one score in the um, beaches to June's um, coastal, res coastal resource and state whether you think it's number one of low importance or number five of very high importance. And I'd like you to do that for all six coastal resources. And this will allow you to sort of get your mind in gear as to which of these coastal resources, in your opinion, are of critical importance. We've un we're going to be undertaking this for all sub areas. So I'd like you to answer this from the perspective of uh, your view, not necessarily from the sub area two perspective, although we are here talking about that area quite soon. But just give me your perspective on all of the, the six coastal resources and sort of their value to you, whether you see them as of low importance or very high importance. So I'll give you about 20 to 25 seconds to consider that. And then the team will present the findings on the screen. Great. So as we go through the various resources, beaches and dunes, which is obviously one of the most priority ones for the country, is I'm pleased to see that everybody has accepted that as being of ultimate importance. 
Coastal cliffs and caves, which is a, a relevant one for this particular sub area, again, is scoring very highly from 71% uh, is being scored. Wetlands, swamps and ponds, more low lying um, natural coastal resources are um, scoring 57%. Uh, interestingly, we're getting 7% of being of, of low importance. We move on to coral reefs and in a similar vein to beaches, we're getting 100% score as expected. And with regard to cultural resources, we are getting a, a bit more of a mix. They're all classified as being important and, and importantly, they're not being classified as uh, in, the, in the very low category. Geological formations, again, are scoring highly at 71% and that includes the importance of landscapes and seascapes. Thank you for that. And the reason why uh, that's actually quite an important poll is because I'm now going to move on to the next um, presentation, which is um, building on the previous one. And it's coupled with the findings of that poll question to demonstrate the approach that the consultant team have adopted towards revising the boundaries of the coastal zone management area. And it also provides an overview as to how new and innovative setback classifications are being proposed. And as stated earlier, the technical details of this, sadly, we, we don't, we can't have the time to go into immense detail, but these are found in volume two of the ICZM plan, particularly in parts A2 for the coastal zone management area and parts C3 for specifically for setbacks. So the first question that needs posing is, well, why do we need a coastal zone management area? And the simple answer um, to that is that there is a formal mandate on the coastal zone management unit to protect coastal resources as defined within the CZM Act of 1998. It also helps to define the boundary or, or alternatively the geographic scope of the revised ICZM plan. So it gives it some context and readers and decision makers understand then which geographic limits the plan is talking about. And the intention is that policies, regulations, or advisories of relevance within the defined coastal zone management area must pay due cognizance to the ICZM plan and associated policies so that development is planned or implemented to be climate resilient in nature. And as a result, this would reduce future coastal risks and ensure the promotion of healthy coastal ecosystems as, as I presented earlier. The coastal zone management is where, essentially where human activities can directly impact upon coastal resources or where land is exposed directly to known hazards. It's the area where all relevant coastal resources apply plus those socioeconomic activities that may have an impact on coastal resource health, the status or their integrity. So in addition to the Coastal Zone Management Act, you may be aware that the more recent Planning and Development Act of 2019 states that any new development proposal that's identified within the Coastal Zone Management Area shall have regards to the provisions and guidelines as set out in the revised ICZM plan. And this basically means that the Coastal Zone Management Unit will be acting in an advisory capacity to all statutory authorities on all relevant policies, regulations and advisories that may apply within this defined area. But what's important to note is that it should be understood that the Coastal Zone Management Area is not the same as a development setback distance. And this difference will be explained a little later in my presentation. So the, the recent poll that you, you carried out for us um, demonstrated that it's important that the range of coastal resources needs to be considered to help determine the spatial extent of the coastal zone management area. So put simply, highly technical surveys and analyses carried out by the coastal zone management unit over the last decade or so have been used to help define the inland and the offshore limits of this coastal zone management area. And this is considered not only the geographic footprint of coastal habitats, such as uh, resources such as beaches, but it also includes the extent of the surf zone 
and the limits of other habitats such as dunes or coral reefs. But it also will embrace the importance of cultural assets, seascapes, landscapes, and key infrastructure. So in, tand in tandem, this assessment then had to be analyzed against latest coastal hazard information. Again, as I presented to you earlier, and this is important to determine the spatial extents of storm surge flooding, coastal erosion extent, cliff collapse, tsunami flood inundation, limits and sea level rise rates. And a set of detailed criteria have been used to help determine the inland and offshore limits of each coastal resource. For example, you'll see in front of you that um, for coral reefs, the criteria used is related to the extent of living shallow water coral reef ecosystems, which is estimated at being close to the 150 bathymetric contour area. Whereas the defined coastal landscape protection area and the national park landscapes as defined within the physical development plan are more likely to command a 200 meter inland buffer from the coastline. So the outcome of this new analysis work is a coastal zone management area that's variable in its extent around the country. The exact coordinates of this area are presented within a new revised, the new revised ICZM plan and details of which are included as a, as a new specific order, which is entitled the Coastal Zone Management Area Boundaries Order of 2021, which includes specific longitude latitude coordinates, each being 50 meters apart from each other. And it's also included as part of the existing Coastal Zone Management Act as a result. So you'll see from this slide, particularly in green, the coastal zone management area has been update, has updated its inland and its offshore limits, which were originally established within the 1998 plan. So you can see those lines as blue diagonal lines on the slide. But put simply, the landward limit includes key terrestrial coastal habitats, seascapes and landscapes, and those areas exposed to coastal hazards, as I've mentioned earlier. This landward area also includes the minimum 30 meter setback distance from high water mark, which is already established within the PDP. And you'll see it's noted by the red arrows in front of you that this differs from the approach that was adopted in 1998 by Halcro, in that the inland limits were commonly defined by coastal roads, um, which is especially observable in this. Um, sub area, sub area two, and as you can see in front of you, in terms of sub areas, sub area one. The seaward limit contains key marine resources and habitats, plus protected or restricted marine areas, areas of outstanding seascape value, and the surf zone, which is what I mentioned earlier. And this is important because this is where active sediment transportation takes place. And that's important because that influences beach profile shape. A separate zone of influence is introduced, and this is new to this revised ICZM plan. And this is defined, which extends from the seaward limit of the coastal zone management area out to the 12 mile territorial limit. Here, the role of the coastal zone management unit will be to raise awareness on marine developments to both the public, the private sector, civil society, and the general public, or where future consideration of an offshore activity is being raised as part of a separate yet parallel blue economy strategy, which some of you may know is already underway in Barbados. This may help to provide advice on the development of joint initiatives to promote the conservation and sustainable exploitation of coastal resources within this zone of influence. So I'm gonna get you to be engaged again. And before we move on to discuss the new approach for development setbacks, we're going to pose a simple poll question on this coastal zone management area. And the question I'd like you to answer is as follows. Do you agree with the new revised delimitation of the coastal management area compared to that that was defined in 1998? Um, the options here are 
yes, I understand the reasoning and I totally understand it and agree with it in totality. You have the option of saying, yes, I understand the reasoning. Oh, we've got that one twice, but we'll move on. Um, the third option is yes, but in part it appears too narrow. You have the option of saying no, um, it, it would be better to remain with the health row definitions in 1998, where I was defining saying that coastal roads were used as uh, an infrastructure inland limit. Or you have the option of saying, I have no view either way. So we apologize, there's two of those which are exactly the same, but we'll allow you to vote for either one of those, um, or you have three others. So I'll leave you to uh, give you 15 to 20 seconds to answer that, and we'll present the answers to you. Okay, I will merge questions one and two because they're basically saying the same thing. Um, which is essentially giving the story that I think we have a, uh, a general acceptance that the, the reasoning behind the new revised coastal zone management area is uh, suitable and it, there's a, a, an, important, an important sort of progression in thinking to um, move on from the work that was done in, um, by Halcro in the original plan. Excellent. This will allow us to move on into uh, how the coastal zone, the revised ICZM plan is being used um, to improve climate resiliency into development planning through the use of planning setbacks. Now, why is this needed? Well, setting restrictions to improve climate compatible physical development within the coastal zone management area is an essential tool to better safeguard coastal resources, as I've mentioned earlier, plus also to minimize inappropriate development within high or even very high coastal risk areas. So setbacks, in fact, are a key tool used by close coastal planners globally. They refer to areas where development should be restricted or where specific provisions need to be imposed or applied to ensure the safety of structures, persons and wider communities, especially in the context of climate change. And in Barbados, setback policies are not new. Though historically linear distances selected were often not technically justified due to a, a poorer understanding of, of climate related impacts. Consequently, the currently defined 30 meter distance from mean high water as defined within the physical development plan and also as stated within the new Planning and Development Act of 2019 has been deemed as somewhat arbitrary and this is why the revised ICZM plan and associated maps, which I'll, I'll be presenting to you in a, in a few moments time, represent a new way forward to guide better development planning within the coastal zone management area. What this revised ICZM plan is now able to offer is a suite of, refine, ref, suite of refined setback distances and categories that are not only dictated by improved scientific understanding, but it's designed to encourage development to take place even within defined limit, so long as they comply with necessary environmental impact assessment regulations and technical studies that are deemed necessary by either town and country planning or as advised by supporting agencies such as Coastal Zone Management Unit or the Ministry of Works. So regarding setback, a series of these different policy types are now proposed within the plan, but they're depending upon spatial topography, conservation landscape value, and the level of coastal risk that is known for a location. Specific points to note with regard to these setbacks are as follows. Firstly, they only apply to new constructions or developments planned after the approval of this revised ICZM plan. And that's an important point to note, particularly as it is a, a thorny area where people are, are wondering whether these are gonna be retroactively um, enforced. 
And secondly, like I've just said, they can't, they would not be retroactively enforced for existing developments. Thirdly, they only apply to major developments that are defined within the physical development plan of 2017. In general, all new or expanded major developments should be located landward of known flood inundation setback limits. Fourthly, it's important to realize as even in the case of major developments, their construction could still take place within a defined setback limit, but so long as the developer carries out the necessary studies and have delivered the evidence to support their application. And st such studies need to demonstrate that new knowledge of flooding or erosion hazards, already produced by the Coastal Zone Management Unit via the um, the encrypt system is embraced and from this information that robust and effective risk reduction measures are included into any design. So what do these setbacks look like in reality? Well you'll see on the screen here as an example of a cliffed coast that they include the fo following possibilities. Firstly, if you have a look at the orange zone, this represents the the minimum 30 meter setback limit as defined within the physical development plan. And this remains the same for everywhere around the coastal zone management area. So this is consistent 30 meters around the country. But this minimum distance may then be enhanced subject to the hazards or resource protection needs of a specific location. And this extra distance will be determined by separate technical analysis. But this can include the following such as in blue, you'll see what is defined as what's called the cliff collapse setback. And again, this is a variable distance and it's classified into seven setback categories according to cliff type as set by Golder Associates, where they did a very thorough geotechnical analysis in 2017. And you can see this from the gray box to the left-hand side of the slide. And from this, you can see a range of total setback distances that might be from either, either 18 meters up to a maximum of 65 meters. And this is very much dependent on the, like I said, the cliff type and the setback category. You'll then see in yellow, a, a landscape setback. And again, this is variable and it can extend from hundred meters in rural areas to 200 meters in land in defined landscape protection areas as defined within the within the PDP. For a low-lying urban coastal area, uh, setbacks are proposed to include the following possibilities. As, it, as above, as I've mentioned earlier, the minimum 30 meter setback in red uh, as defined within the PDP remains for everywhere within the coastal zone management area. And this minimum distance may then be enhanced subject to the hazards or resource protection needs. And this extra distance will be determined by separate technical analysis, but it could include in blue, a flood inundation setback, which again is variable. And this will include storm surge flood um, return risks to a, a one in 100 year um, storm return event. Plus, any additional tsunami flood extents which have already been modelled. You'll see in yellow a climate change adaptation setback and again this is variable but it's basically used to add on to the flood inundation setback to embrace the latest most relevant IPCC sea level rise projections for Barbados. So my final presentation, just for 10 minutes, is to build on the first two presentations, but focus briefly on the specific features of Subarea 2, coupled with a brief description of the various maps that have been produced for, for Subarea 2. Because as you know, the presentation today is one of eight being run for different subareas as defined within the plan. So with regards to Subarea 2, which extends from Kittredge Point to Consett Point. This covers a short section of the southeast coast of Barbados. In fact, it's the shortest 
sub area stretch of all our eight that we'll be presenting. The main landscape features of, the, of this rocky coastline are Ragged Point and Skeets Bay. Importantly, the whole coastline of sub area two is classified within the PDP as a coastal landscape protection zone. So in that sense, it's quite unique and highly important to the country. The land use is characterized by small scale agricultural holdings and the settlements of Seely Hill, Whitehaven and Skeets Bay are present. Some sections of the coast are subject to new development applications and this may cause conflict with local community perspectives and, the, and their views. The marine habitats in the nearshore environment are, are comprised of coral rubble and supporting algal beds. And finally, due to the sub areas topography, it's of interest that it experiences quite a reduced um, number of coastal risks that are related to climate change. There are some aspects of storm surge, coastal flood inundation, although Skeets Bay is calculated to be exposed only to a, a one in 25 year storm period surge event. Cliff collapse is an issue, um, and this is classified as a being of medium risk throughout most of this sub area. But at this time, it's important, um, it's perhaps relevant here to remind you of the six ICZM policy outcomes that have been set for the coastal zone management area, and as were referred to by Dr. Brewster earlier. And you'll see these at the right hand side. From this complete list, perhaps the most relevant outcomes policies for this sub area too, include those that are stated as outcomes one and two. And those are namely socioeconomic development is achieved and also coastal resources are protected and effectively managed. And I'll mention these two outcomes again uh, in a moment. This slide is taken from part D of the revised ICZM plan, specifically for sub area two. And based on the risks and features known in this sub area, it shows that a series of possible actions could be considered. You'll see on the left hand side that each possible action assigned for sub area two is aligned to the, re to the revised general guidance topics, which have been produced in detail within part C of the ICZM plan. For example, you'll see that each action is also given a unique code and highlighted in pink, you'll see a couple of examples for discussion. Firstly, under the general guidance topic of development planning and setbacks, an action is defined to prepare and distribute guidelines to enforce cliff collapse setback policies in sub area two for developers and public agencies. Likewise, to support the coastal biodiversity general theme, an action is set to promote improved fishery schemes for Skeets Bay. And this would include strategies for the jetty, in addition to fish landing facilities, etc. And this is an important local issue, as Skeets Bay, as I'm sure you know, is a community of fisher folk, and hence it's an important base for local fishermen who operate trap fisheries out on the nearby reefs, as well as targeting deep slope pelagic fish stocks. I mean, almost every man and woman and child is touched by fishing in this particular sub area. And if they're not fishing professionally, they may well, may well be fishing to live, mostly by boat or by standing on the jetty or sitting on, sitting on rocks. So actions are hereby proposed to rehabilitate fisher folks' livelihoods, focusing on the fish market, which is currently in uh, quite a poor state. You can hereby see that some actions are planning or advisory in nature, whereas others are more tangible in terms of encouraging physical intervention works that hopefully are of value to the local community. But importantly, the revised ICZM plan provides the opportunities for sustainable development to take place that are in line with a strong and robust set of ICZM policy outcomes and goals, as you can see on the right hand side. And of course, much more detail can be provided and is provided in the revised in the revised draft ICZM plan. And if you have not had time to review these details, I urge you to review parts C and D of the plan in particular, so you can find out uh, these specific details on the CZMU website. 
My final few slides are just to show you um, the details of the maps which have been produced in the plan in part D. And this slide shows the legend or the key which has been produced for all description related maps. And you can see that these maps only show um, environmental features, natural or restricted areas, coastal classifications such as whether the coast is eroding, whether it's accreting, or whether it's stable, plus any other associated flood related hazards that are falling within the defined coastal zone management area. So with regard to the latter point, this helps to deliver, as I've mentioned earlier, the revised ICZM policy outcome three, which is namely climate and disaster risk adaptive capacity is strengthened. And this will be, um, this should be best implemented through compliance um, with the following suite of maps that are contained within the revised plan. We can see at the eastern tip of sub area two uh, that from Kittredge Point right the way through to Culpeper Island that coastal cliffs are present and these are reported as experiencing moderate levels of failure and slippage. As a consequence of these features and with regard to setback policies we can see in this part of the sub area too, that there are recommendations for landscape setback up to the limits of the coastal zone management area. As a consequence of this whole area falling within the, the physical development plans, coastal landscape protection zone designation. You see also that specific cliff collapse setback distances um, will also be subject to the different cliff classifications that are given to this area as defined earlier in my presentation. So you can see those as the, the deep red areas. But just to reaffirm that the setback guidance, which is defined for the different setback categories, applies only to planned constructions and developments, and it cannot be retroactively be enforced for existing developments. Further northwest from Culpeper Island through to Concert Point, you'll see that Skeets Bay occurs, which is recording uh, recorded as being a stable bay formation, though it is exposed to storm surge inundation risks. Although the once thriving fish market looks somewhat forgotten at, at the present time, fisher folks still fish in this area by boat and off the rocks and jetty, and the market still remains the focal point for the fishing community here. So as I've mentioned earlier, this is like, like an, an important socio environmental area that requires the plan's um, focused attention. From Skeets Bay via Bell Point to Concert Point, the coastal cliffs reappear again. And the geological composition of the promontory at Bell Point means that the risk of cliff, coastal cliff collapse is reduced in comparison to the remainder of the coastal stretch up to Concert Point, which is classified as being of medium risk. As a consequence of these features and with regard to setback policies, we can see in this part of the sub area too that there are recommendations for landscape setback up to the limit of the coastal zone management area and cliff collapse setback of varying distances depending on cliff type. This stretch interestingly doesn't, um, does propose some short flood inundation setback policies for specific areas, especially within Skeets Bay. So in light of that quick overview to sub area two, I now invite you to um, take this final poll question before I pass back to Alison for the general Q&A session of the presentation. And this final question is asking you the simple question for sub area two, and based on what you've heard from myself in this final presentation, what measures do you believe are needed in the future for this area? You have a choice of new engineering measures to support the protection, rehabilitation or management of coastal habitats present. And those could be hard measures, could be soft measures or a, or a hybrid mix. Secondly, you have a choice of new social measures are needed to support improved um, vulnerable community resilience to coastal hazards. Or thirdly, that new economic measures are needed to support local fisher folk, tourist beaches, or conservation aspects for this particular sub area. 
So I'd be very interested to get your, the answers to this um, because it will set the, uh, the platform for the Q&A session that's going to um, ensue after this. So we'll give you another five to 10 seconds to answer that. And then we'll see what the answers are which are coming back. And interestingly, we've got a, a half of the half attendees are saying that the approach is probably needed from an engineering perspective. Very close to that is that new economic measures are needed to support local, local fisher folk. On, only 10% are saying that new social measures uh, are actually required. If we combined the answer to number one and three, we could interestingly come up with an, uh, a discussion on, well, how do we uh, manifest economic measures to benefit the area? And will they, could they be done in the absence of any engineering structures or do they go hand in hand with it? The answers so far look like the two need to go hand in hand. And that will be an interesting discussion point. So from here, Alison, I'll pass back to yourself um, to open the floor to uh, the, for the general Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I hope that you all have your questions ready and raring to go. I've opened my tab and I see no questions so far. So I hope you start uh, sending those questions to me as a matter of urgency. Uh, the other issue is that, Jonathan, you were mentioning uh, this encrypt. I know, but you did not uh, explain what is this encrypt system. So I'm going to let Ramon uh, let the audience know how we use the encrypt in developing the coastal plan. Over to you, Ramon. Thank you very much, Alison. Good night, everyone. My name is Ramon Roach. I am the Coastal Information Systems Manager for the Coastal Zone Management Unit. So as Jonathan was referring to the encrypt, uh, that stands for the National Coastal Risk Information and Planning Platform. It is a software tool that allows us to analyze risk. So we are, it, is a, it is a way that we can, with the information that we have on where our resources are, both in terms of um, uh, built infrastructure and uh, utilities, et cetera, and how those combine with our information that we have developed in terms of what the extent of hazards are going to be or, or are likely to be given climate change factors into the future. Um, these hazards include storm surge, uh, rainfall induced flooding, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, storm winds, etc. So, com so combining the information on where the assets are Combine that with the information on where the hazards are likely to occur and with the level of their severity. Combine that with the information we have on the value or estimated value of, of these assets. We can get an idea of what the risk is or what, 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 is, the, what is the dollar amount that it would cost to repair or replace these assets in the event that they were damaged by an event of a particular severity. So by having this risk information, within this um, software platform. It allows us to, to, to better understand what are the trade-offs that we are making by either allowing development to occur under certain circumstances or by um, investing money to reduce the, the, the level of threat of particular hazards. So for instance, if it is that the value of uh, assets at risk from a, a storm surge is $2 million. And this, this, this potential loss can be reduced if we invest $100,000 in a measure that will reduce storm surge, then we can, we can understand that there's, there's this net benefit, there's a, there's a, there's a cost gain, or the gain in savings uh, by implementing this measure versus um, allowing things to continue as business as usual. So it, 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 it really is a tool to allow us to invest wisely in our mitigation actions. And as a 
component of development of the plan. It allowed, it allowed us to identify areas where you would you, the policy should be guided by this risk information when it comes to new developments occurring. That it isn't just that uh, uh, a development is supposed to occur in a particular area, and we know that that development is potentially exposed to a hazard. Now we actually can understand to what degree is this development exposed to this particular hazard? What was that risk if this development is allowed to go ahead without certain mitigation measures being put into place? So it allows us to, to promote more resilient development as a country so that we know that if we, in the event that we do have an event or some kind of disaster, we will be reducing the, the level of our losses versus what would have happened if we did not have this additional information or promoting this type of risk resilient or risk tolerant development. Thanks, Ramon. Are there any questions from Ramon in the use of the National Coastal Risk Information and Planning Platform? Are, are there any questions in general? Okay, I'm going to go on to another question which we need some clarification on. Uh, Jonathan in his presentation said and showed the map that the, there's a setback of 30 meters from high water mark. Um, Fabian, who is a coastal planner, can you clarify what this uh, 30 meter setback, what that is applied to? Fabian? Hello, good night, everyone. Um, the 30 meter setback, for example, would be typically applied um, for regarding beachfront development under our usual circumstances. Um, you could appreciate that beachfront development is at low elevation. Beaches are made of sand, which is unconsolidated material that can erode quite easily under the right conditions. So that 30 meter setback is from a high water mark. It's surveyed at a particular time in the moon cycle. And it is featured on what is called um, storm severest plots. So that's the official high water mark that has to be surveyed and uh, illustrated on the submitted plans. And that 30 meter setback has been established as that minimum lower setback, ideal minimum lower setback, which should reduce. Um, infrastructures develop vulnerability, sorry, just threats such as storm surge and encroachment of our seas, be it by sea level rise over um, a long period of time. Okay, so there in other areas um, where I would have met, where you would appreciate that would be cliffed up areas, the tour cliffs. And the high water mark can also coincide uh, basically at the same location in many instances. And uh, therefore, it is at the toe of the cliff where it normally will coincide with the location of the high water mark that also forms a reference point for setbacks for cliff top areas. <clears throat> All right. So, in general terms, to wrap up that question, the 30 meter setback um, predominantly features um, along beachfront areas. It's an ideal minimum lower setback that we would like um, all developments to have. But of course, um, if anyone, and I'm sure everyone can appreciate that if you go on any portion of our west and south coast, that because of historical erosion and a few other factors, that you would see many existing structures located um, within that 30 meter setback area. All right. Thank you. Hope that answers the question. 
Thank you, Fabian. So we have two different types of setbacks. He's basically saying the 30 meter setback is applied to lands adjacent to beaches. And then there are different setbacks along the coast where there are cliffs, depending on the type of na the nature of the cliffs. So the 30 meter setback doesn't apply entirely around the island, but for areas adjacent to, to beaches. Now we have two questions and thank you for submitting those two questions. The first one is, have you identified areas where critical coastal resources have already been significantly compromised? And does the new plan outline measures to remediate any of the key coastal resources? Which person on my panel will be able to answer this question? Uh, Jonathan, can you answer this question for me? I can certainly go halfway down the line for that. Yeah. Um, the way that the plan is written is to uh, present the framework for options. And those options can only be uh, pursued once there's a, a clear understanding of sort of resource health, resource um, integrity. So the analysis of the, the various um, studies that have taken place have, have clearly identified where there were stresses taking place along various sub areas. And don't forget the definition and the, the boundary limits for a lot of the, the um, sub areas are influenced by a number of environmental, physical and human factors. So specific information on whether a uh, Gorgonian platform is, you know, is, is particularly um, reduced in its health since 1998 will be picked up if extra, extra uh, surveys have been taking place. But where that is slightly uncertain, what the plan has produced is part C, which goes into uh, uh, good detail in a range of general theme topics. And those general theme topics, for example, yeah, in that example, using coastal biodiversity as the theme, it's articulating where there are stresses around the Barbadian coast. It's identifying um, potential remedial factors that could be could be adopted, and it's also identifying. Uh, there's kind of the partnership arrangements that are going to be needed around the country, be it from government, be it from private sector, be it from civil society, to, uh, to basically identify what needs to be done. What the plan doesn't do is go into fine minutiae detail as to the action that's going to be needed. You saw in my presentation some of the, the levels of detail that the ICZM plan is presenting. What the plan, the purpose of that plan is to then encourage that an action needs to be done so that, you know, basic decisions can be made in that one location. So if there's a particular coastal resource that is threatened, the action will be rehabilitation in, in a sustainable manner. How that can be done would be a range of potential opportunities. Those opportunities are listed at a quite high level, but it's enabling the discussions to take place for attention to be placed in that particular topic and that location. So I, I partly answered that by saying that the plan sets the framework for the answers to be provided to know where a critical coastal resource needs some love and attention. So that I think Alison provides the, the answer, but I would recommend that everybody reviews the plan and, and takes a close look at part C, because part C is where there's a lot of detailed um, information on a range of themes and topics, and particularly the identified actions that are going to be needed to address that, that aspect. And we do go into a lot of detail on different types of coastal resources. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Would anyone else on the panel like to add to what Jonathan just um, said? And uh, author of that question, did we uh, sufficiently 
answer your question. Just type and let me know if you think we sufficiently answered that question. Okay, Ramon said he would like to, to add to that question, to, to do a response. Ramon? No, I was just clearing clearing the uh, question from okay. the chat. Okay. All right. The the um the author said yes. He that we answered uh, um sufficiently. I have another question though, and it says regarding question number three of the last poll, the Skeets Bay fish market was built, and surrounding land acquired, with more than fish landing in mind. It has local and tourism daytime and nighttime potential. It will not realize this potential while operated by the state, but perhaps with private sector or local area, for example, Bayfield, social, economic, cooperative entrepreneurship. And they've asked us to discuss this. Um, Dr. Brewster, perhaps I can get you to, to start building a response to this question. Alison, 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 you're always trying the hard ones at me. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Skis Bay area is, is one of those locations that over time you've seen changes in activity taking place there. Um, as Jonathan rightly pointed out, uh, the, the fish market itself has, has fallen into some considerable disrepair over the years. And it is important that the inherent nature of the site be retained for what it really is, which is the, the, fishing, the fishing community and the activities that take place there. So any activities that can incorporate that community structure and process as part and parcel of any new rollout, I think is something that should be welcome for the area. I also think that uh, the use of the site remaining as a public space as well, given the nature and how people like to have access to the, the East Coast and its environs generally, is something that also becomes very important. One thing that you have to bear in mind when you're looking at planning along these lines as well, it's just something that Fabian may, may wish to expand on as well. You have a situation where you can't just up and transpose different types of socioeconomic uh, activities to other locations because they may work well in one location, okay? And um, I think that's why even as part of looking at the characterization of the shoreline into the eight sub areas, you can see how uniquely different they are and, and they support certain type of activities and would not necessarily be conducive for others. So um, keeping that in mind, I think the rounded approach to how the area can be developed is something that we're very open to, to discussion and participating in, in, in any way. All right, if, if, if we can add, um, in terms of, if, if you have access and, and I'm speaking to the public here and the person that would have posed the question, um, on page 241 of the plan, um, there is a text there which speaks to the same Skeets Bay. Um, the fact that there will be a need to marry um, maybe tourism type of investment, you know, uh, with the local fishing activities there. Um, so the plan does make an attempt to, to bring that very issue at Skeets Bay to the fore. It, the full forefront. It also makes mention of some of the issues there that um, in terms of sargasm accumulation that can impact both fisheries operations and any tourism related operations. And certainly with a good marriage between the two, um, you can expect that, that the local communities can, can have in time in, improve employment opportunities um, social slash recreational opportunities in terms of spillover from food from the fishery sector, maybe being bought by tourism related operations in that area of coastline and so on and so forth. So you can see some spin off 
impacts potential that, 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 that could develop in the area. Um, certainly it's something that requires further analysis and development from a planning perspective, which includes the economic and social as well as the environmental issues. Um, so I, I, I would encourage you to peruse um, from that section of the draft plan that is featured on our website. Thank you. But, yeah, but to also build on that, Fabian, you also have to um, remember that it doesn't have to necessarily be the classic sort of tourism sort of product that you're looking at as well. Yeah. It can be it can be more uh, integrated and more applied in terms of its approach to be more conducive to fitting in with the community that you're dealing with. So the concept was just putting either high rise down there or mass tourism sort of a com either accommodation or facilities to provide for, for large numbers down there uh, at any one point of time does not fit in with the overall construct of how the East Coast is supposed to be rolled out for its type of development. But it does provide opportunity for new considerations for tourism uh, development in the long run. Yes, the plan does encourage a more softer approach. Uh, we're applicable. Uh, thank you both, Dr. Bruce and Fabian Hines. Um, remember, we had a first question about the identification of critical resources. Someone has a follow-up question to that, and they were speaking about concerns at Spikestown, where the folks there are concerned about the beach erosion, which threatens businesses at present. Is there anything that is being done for this particular area? This will be dealt with in the next, in the, um, in the sub area in which Spikestown lies, but is there anything that we can add or explain for this particular question raised by one of our participants? Um, I, I really think that, okay, all right, we'll come again. I think that um, <laughs> it is an it, it is going to be extensively discussed when we get to the the sub area uh, that that covers the whole spice down stretch, and it is something that um, is is worthy of consideration. At this point in time, though, the coastal zone management unit is working as part of the work done within the Coastal Risk Assessment and Management Program to come up with additional designs for the, the, the immediate area north of Spice Town and Sand Street. So um, we have targeted some areas in Spice Town for work to be done there, as well as the areas of, of Clinkett's and Sherman's, et cetera. Um, so it is, it is being projected for future coastal engineering works um, when the next phase of the coastal conservation program starts to roll out. But it'll be just, the, the, the issue can be raised when we get to the spice stone stretch of the, of the ECM. Thank you, Dr. Brewster. Maybe I have point, another Alison. Sorry, Alice, I was going to say just to sort of maybe give a strategic perspective and, and building on Dr. Brewster's point, whilst not necessarily talking specifically about spice town, what the what this revised ICZM plan also is adding to for the first time, it's actually got quite a detailed section on emerging issues. So there's a section in part C, which is talking about emerging issues. Now, why am I talking about that when the question was about spice down beach erosion? Well, the reason for that is that the coastal zone management unit are being faced in a far more frequent way with new topics which are new planning applications and new issues that are exacerbating beach erosion. So the plan is quite innovative in the sense that it is embracing climate and disaster risk resilience but couching it in a future in a in a future appreciation of how tourism is changing, how planning is changing, how financiers are coming to Barbados and, and considering new issues. So whether the new style of restaurant on piers wishes to be developed, as we know in Spikestown is, you know, you know, is one is one issue. Whether 
you know, the whole concept of um, the, you know, the wider blue economy, how that is going to impact on established coastal communities, all needs to be embraced under the, you know, under this gambit of this, of this risk resilient ICZM product. And this is where that, you know, I'd like to say that it's, it's quite innovative globally to have this plan that's going to be embracing emerging issues and having the necessary caveats in place for developers to determine what needs to be done and why. So that issues such as beach erosion in Spitestown can be properly thought through and in an integrated manner. So like Dr. Brewster said, we're probably gonna have to talk in quite some detail about Spitestown in a, in a few days, in a few weeks time when we, when we hit that sub area. But for the audience today, you know, bear in mind that the plan is considering a whole range of emerging issues, which for the first time is coming up with some quite interesting advisories for um, the CZMU to consider. So I just thought I'd add that to the, uh, to the debate, Alison. Yes, thank you very much. I hope we've answered your question in terms of what does it mean for Spikestone and those areas where um, we have coastal resources that need, um, need to be protected. I have a question though. Um, what does the landscape setback mean? What does that mean for this particular sub area? And Jonathan, I think you probably are best place in the cameras focused on you. Can, I think yes. you're best place to, um, to answer this. In, in, in a way that's quite a simple one to answer. Um, this area is quite unique because we are, it's full 100% covered by the physical development plans um, policy as being a coastal protection landscape zone. And what that means is that it's already, it's already got a, uh, a defined limit of 200 metres from mean high water. So my presentation when I was talking about the, uh, the inland limits of the coastal zone management area, um, in this instance, means that it, it will embrace all of the coastal zone management area because it would cover um, that, that spatial extent. Now, okay, the question is, okay, what does that mean if we wanted to do a development? What that basically means for a developer is that they will need to demonstrate very clearly that their development is not having any deleterious impact on seascape or landscape value in that particular area and the implications that that has on the wider you know, on, on, on adjacent sub areas. So the spatial extent in this sub area represents the limit of the coastal zone management area. The implications for a development planning application, and I'm sure Fabian may want to add to this, is that there would have to be um, demonstrated um, designs to mitigate any impacts on, on landscape or seascape quality for, for the area. Thanks, Jonathan. Fabian, did you want to add anything or? I think it was, it was, it was well said um, and, and we ensure the setbacks um, would serve to protect the landscape in terms of particularly things like coastal vegetation or coastal woodland, um, the presence of any sand dunes. Um, there are some areas where you have cliff with beach at the top. Uh, we treat development in those areas as cliff top and not the front. So therefore, there will be no development in terms of if we have any pocket beaches at the top of any cliffs, uh, particularly coming around the neck of, the neck of that area of, of, of coastline. Um, it is important, and, and as we proceed as in subsequent meetings, uh, as we go into more the national part of Barbados, um, it will come to the four more as we discuss the, the natural heritage conservation area within the same context as we're talking about the coastal landscape um, protection zone. So the, the, the principle remains the same. We want to protect the natural features that, that, that reside in those areas along with any um, ecosystem relationships and processes. We talk about natural resources a lot, uh, but the unit not only serves to protect natural resources, but we try to protect the coastal processes 
uh, in terms of sediment transport and the ecological relationships that exist there in, in, within that space. Okay, all right, thank you. And I just wanna add a few things in that the, what we're trying to do with that um, landscape protection zone is to make sure we preserve the views and the characteristics of that rural environment so it doesn't become like a bridge town or whatever. So for example, if you're going to build a house in that area, you might be asked to paint the house, the roof green or a sky blue so that your house will not stick out in that, in that landscape. You might be asked, for example, to use timber instead of stone in, in an area like this. So it's to protect this landscape because it's a unique feature along the Barbadian coastline. If you go, for example, at St. Mark's Church, which has a panoramic view of the east coast of the island, uh, one of the best views in Barbados, and you look towards like Codvington College and Society Hill and those types of areas, you will notice that there's a lot of trees, a lot of vegetation. So this landscape protection zone will try to maintain the characteristics of that treed area and make sure that it maintains that salubrious um, surroundings that we, that we like so much in Barbados. So that is the purpose of that landscape protection zone. All right. I have a question here now. It says, why the plan cannot address everything, does it go far enough to set out recommended state and non-state institutional arrangements and partnerships required to practically move from plan to action? For example, does it sufficiently guide and enable implementations? And we know in Barbados that we have issues with implementation. So I will start with Jonathan again um, to explain how the plan deals with moving from a paper document to implementation. Jonathan. Thanks, Alison. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of detail on this is answered in part E of the plan. There's quite a thorough um, assessment on institutional arrangements, on financing, and on that transition from talk to action. Um, what the plan is not going to be doing is necessarily introducing brand new institutional structures, because Barbados basically is sitting on uh, in a, a, a range of all the necessary legislative forms, um, statutes. It's just that sometimes that, that coordination mechanism is, you know, basically could be improved upon. So the plans part E goes into quite some detail on how this is actually going to be set up, how the coordination mechanisms are going to be um, uh, delivered. And they're going, to, they're going to be delivered in line with existing legislation and the uh, Planning and Development Act of 2019, for example, is one of the, um, you know, the updated pieces of legislation that's going to help initiate that coordinating mechanism to support coastal zone management in its advisory role. Um, but there's a range of um, other supporting coordinating mechanisms which will need to be encouraged and, and facilitated to move particularly those areas that I mentioned earlier in terms of emerging issues, because essentially some of those don't have a home and there's going to be some, uh, you, you know, some new initiatives that are gonna be needed to um, promote and to generate the traction needed to move from plan to action on the ground. So, I would thoroughly recommend that uh, people review the plan on the website, but focus specifically on part E, which does give that, um, that level of detail, which I think that question was, um, was looking for. Feel free to uh, add to that any, any member of the panel. I'd like to add though that this is not a, people see it as a, a coastal zone management unit plan, but this is a all of Barbados plan, which involves uh, NGOs, members of our fishing community, public sector organizations, 
every person has a stake in how this plan is implemented. Jonathan has done his framework for, for implementation, but we all must take the policies and plans on board. And if we have, if we need to have a successful plan for Barbados to maintain one, our coastal resources, and two, the place we go to live, to work, to play, Thing, a place we go to enjoy. So this is not a plan for the Coastal Zone Management Unit, but a, all of Barbados um, uh, plan. I don't know if any person on the team would like to add to that. Yes, so I, I will go after Ricardo as he has his hand raised. Oh yes, yes, Ricardo. Very right, good evening, everyone. Yeah, just following up on Jonathan's comments. Um, yeah, well, the plan does speak to it in general terms. We've just secured grant funding from the Inter-American Development Bank to follow up in relation to assessing the potential for public private partnerships in uh, coastal projects. Um, a consultancy would be executed with the clear mandate to establish a transparent and clear model, uh, develop an actual business case, um, and then run a pilot project. So there are a number of potential considerations um, looking at things like the management of coastal zone management areas, maybe even something like uh, sustainable sand harvesting um, in an environmentally um, conscious manner that will allow a quick return to normalcy after storm events. So there are, there will be a, a, an a, a actual output in terms of a pilot project um, and then we're hoping to use this model to move further to look at other, other um, opportunities for involving the private sector in funding coastal initiatives. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Dr. Alina, I see you have your hand up as well. Yes, thank you, Alison. I, I... My, my hand was up before the question with the implementation, although I just want to add that, yes, there's a, there's a good, um, there'll be a marriage between the coastal zone management plan and the physical development plan, as Jonathan had, had indicated in his pre presentation. My question, though, goes back to the one before the landscape set back, and I just wondered if we could get a, a little bit more clarity in terms of the extent of that landward boundary, given that we're now moving from the 1998 physical boundary of a road, and now you're, it is variable boundaries depending on the criteria that you're using in each sub area. And I wondered, given that this, this coastal zone management area being such a critical zone for direct impact on coastal resources, et cetera, how does the average person know whether they're in that zone or not? Because now there's no physical thing that you look at and say, I'm, I'm, I'm on the land, the seaward side of the road, or below the ridge, or how do you know when you're in that coastal zone management area for the purposes of, um, I guess, in, impacts on the coastal resources and, and for, for implementation of the same landward landscape setbacks that you were just referring to? I just wondered if there was some mechanism for people to find out where the way they sit. Uh, thanks, Dr. Alina. I'll pass that to Leo, and I will add to that after the director speaks. I think um, it is a good question. Thanks a lot, Chair. Um, one of the things that you have to bear in mind is that the, <clears throat> the order is going to be laid out in terms of coordinates. And <clears throat> rather than trying to provide the traditional description about you follow the road and then you turn to a southwest and then you turn to a southeast and go down in a gully and that sort of thing, um, the, the approach that we've tried to take this time is to, to, to develop a system through the use of, of coordinates, which some people may find a little uh, difficult to use, to be more effective for ensuring that you have a better understanding. Uh, generally, though, given the type of boundary that, that we are looking at for, for this, this sort of uh, inland position, what will happen is that it would really and truly apply only to new developments or person looking to do renovative work to their properties that, that would then be, when the application comes into us, it would then be being considered um, at that point in time. It, it would be very difficult to do some form of signposting along the route to indicate where it is. Uh, but 
that that for right now would be would be the best way that we can 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 look at it. It is going to be defined by coordinates along the way. Um, perhaps, Dr. Ali, we probably need to do some um, big enough plans so that people can know whether they're in or out. Maybe, uh, maybe a different scale, yes, that, that yes, might help. Yes, I think that will help and share this along with our partners, uh, town planning and uh, lands and survey, all the different agencies who are involved in land management. That is the way that we can um, perhaps deal with that matter to let people know where the boundary is based by coordinates um, in, in the early. So I think that's a task for us to start to plot it and, and, and place it on maps and place it on our website and place it and everywhere that people will go to for information uh, on this matter. I hope I've been able to answer your question, Dr. Ali. Yes, I, oh, someone else had up their hand before I can. Who else had up their hand? I didn't see anybody else. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to build a little bit also on what um, Jonathan was talking about in terms of the response for the potential for implementation. Well, as, as you know, Coastal is really strong on implementation. So once we get going, you know that we're gonna deliver. Um, I think the point that also has to be made is that this new plan differs from the old plan in 98 in the sense that we have now certain deliverable evaluation criteria that we can now actually assess how well we are doing in terms of the overall rollout and implementation of aspects of the coastal zone management plan that can be done uh, on an annual or biennial basis, okay? And I think that that is something that is new and innovative and allows us to track our progress. But as always, implementation also depends heavily on political will and commitment and uh, not would, I'm proud to say that we've always had strong political will and commitment from uh, all aspects of government for as long as we've been in existence since 1983. So um, I would expect that we would still have this ongoing aspect of, of our ability to implement the work that we set out to do in the longer term. Anybody else has anything to add to this? Um, I have um, a question. Go ahead, go ahead, Fabian. No, sorry. No, I, I, I think Leo basically um, and the others really summed it up well because we have a plan. Um, it's a policy document. It's not a hard and fast must do document in any sense of the word, just like the physical development plan. Um, we made recommendations um, with the plan as our foundation. That's the construct that we have to operate in. Um, as the director pointed out, we made every effort to move from, from concept to, to, to policy to implementation. And I hope that it is recognized that we have demonstrated that over the years of our existence as a unit. Um, and you you have to recognize that in the context of physical development control, we made recommendations in the context of trying to, to shore up our coastline, protect our natural resources, protect the processes that occur on the coastline. We advise, we issue our advice um, accordingly uh, with the utmost competency um, that we possibly could. And, you know, you recognize that we, that there are three pillars of sustainable development. There's the economic pillar, there's that social equity pillar, and there's that environmental pillar. And there's a constant balance, not only in terms of managing the space that we have to manage in terms of the coastal zone management area, but it's that constant balance as well in terms of managing a country and taking care of all of our sundry under each of those pillars. So with that in mind, 
and with a clear understanding of the interaction between these brothers and not think that they're separate, but they all interact with each other in a very dynamic way. I, I, I sometimes the balance um, of those pillars may not necessarily, you know, um, go the way that, you know, strict environmentalists may want, but, you know, that is simply the reality of management and the reality of trying to keep the country on track. And what we do here at the Coastal Zone Management, uh, Management Unit, along with our strategic partners, town planning and, and, and EPD and, and, and various ministries in government, is try our best to, to, to protect our resources, natural resources and processes, and to issue the best possible comprehensive advice so that informed decisions can be made for the betterment of the country. Thank you. That's, that's all I want to say. Uh, thanks, Fabian, for your impassioned, uh, your passion uh, explanation. Uh, somebody has asked, what is the expected implementation cost for this plan and over what period? What is the expected implementation cost for the plan and over what period? I'm going to throw this to Jonathan and then I can ask the director or Antonio. I haven't heard Antonio as yet explain what is this, uh, try to answer this question for the audience. Okay, thanks, Alison. And a nice, easy question to uh, to, to to answer. the The cost aspect is um, subject to basically the acceptance of of this draft plan. However, the the, <coughs> the areas of magnitude that are we going to be talking about um, are, are going to be heavily influenced by the, the the accepted policies in place. If we went round the island and the plan identified engineering works, which actually it doesn't. Um, but if that was the nature of the plan, then it would be much easier to give a give a figure. The fact that this plan is providing actions which are um, guide, uh, providing guidance, uh, it's providing uh, community support packages, um, will will mean that the actual final cost is going to be quite difficult. To, to, to give you an answer answer to. The second part of the question was, um, just remind me, Alison, it was over what period? The, the period of this plan is, is 10 years and um, the uh, policy framework, volume one, has an appendix in it, which actually sets out um, key performance indicators for a 10 year period and um, the, Within that are the delivery mechanisms for various um, uh, stakeholder uh, responsibilities over short term, which would be one to three years, medium term, one to five years, and longer term, five to five to ten years. So that's the that's the length of this plan. The, and so the cost implications will change based on the short term needs. The medium term needs and the, and the longer term needs and in parallel to this um, Barbados are pursuing um, the um, a blue economy roadmap some aspects of that will need to sort of be embraced within uh, the implementation strategy of the ICZM plan and linking Alison to one of the other questions which which has been raised Maybe I can sort of touch on that as well, knowing that that time is uh, is moving on. That the question was being raised about they're pleased to see the area of influence, including this this zone of influence. And the question is, say, what types of policies are applied to this marine area? And my reference to the blue economy is relevant here because the zone of influence um, is more likely to be uh, addressed under a future marine spatial plan which will have specific plan uh, policies aligned to that area at the moment the recommendation is that this zone of influence has um uh, the coastal zone management's interest at stake but in an advisory capacity 
until a decision is reached in terms of how a marine spatial plan for Barbados is set up, managed and implemented. So the Ministry of um, Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy are reviewing that process as we speak. The ICZM plan will focus on the coastal zone management area, but allowing a zone of influence to be part of the discussion in both now and in the, in the future. So I'll give you that answer there, um, but feel free panel members to add anything with regard to anything I've missed out. Anyone else wants to answer, provide an addition to that answer from Jonathan? I hope we've answered your question, um, author of that question. I hope we have. If we have, please type and let me know. I will go on to another question that we have. Uh, the author says, I'm happy to see the introduction of the era of influence, really offshore. What types of policies and programs being considered to manage this area? What other institutional partners might be involved in this area? So we can first start with this one for the off the area of influence. What are the types of policies and programs to manage this area? Anyone wants to answer this question on the panel? It builds on what I what I just implied earlier that the uh, yes. the zone of influence will be essentially managed by a marine spatial plan, which is separate to the uh, geographic remit of of the ICZM plan. Uh, the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy will be uh, taking responsibility for for moving that forward under its Blue Economy roadmap. Um, the details of which are being um, sort of developed now, maybe the director could could add to that, but essentially that's that that question answered, Alison. Thanks, Jonathan. Leo, do you want to add anything or Antonio? Yeah, Alison, uh, good night everybody. Um, oops, uh, I'm not getting the camera on. Um, anyway, good night everybody. It's Antonio Roy, Deputy Director of Courses on Management Unit. I just wanted to add, um, in terms of, yes, in terms of the question about the other institutional partners that might be involved in this area, um, obviously, there are people who would have existed in, in, in that outer zone of influence uh, in, a, in a very heavy way, like the Ministry of Energy, the offshore oil, and of course, our partners in, in fisheries and so on. So we, we would expect to partner with them and, and, and ensure that our uh, policies plan and so on would align with their uh, with their policies as well and, and, and so there's no real overlap or any conflict between the, the how the how the um, space is managed I just wanted to, um, to get that in there yeah and just to build on on what um Antonio just recently said, I think also it must be borne in mind that the integrated coastal zone management plan uh, constitutes part and parcel of the marine spatial plan that is currently being developed for the island, um, as, as he rightly pointed out, and the relationships that are already pre-existing will have to be considered. But what this speaks to also is the, the, the point that Jonathan made regarding the, the linkage to the blue economy and the the um, connectivity between that and, a, and developing a sustainable ocean-based economy and trying to ensure that the, that connectivity which is being identified can lead to a proper ocean governance structure and system that can be rolled out and, and effectively managed, right? Um, so everything is incremental, but at the same time, uh, at this point in time, because the new Ministry of the Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy is, is currently working on rolling out several activities simultaneously, there will be a point of, of um, conversion later on down in the system, which will fit in well with our, our medium term plans in terms of how the, the plan rolls out in the longer term. And then you'll start to see everything being synchronous going forward. Thanks, Leo. I have one another question. How often will the plan be updated after implementation? 
How often will the plan be updated? And someone on the panel, please feel free to answer this question. The, uh, the answer to that, Alison, is that whilst there'll be midterm reviews every five years, the plan will be um, formally set up within the law to say it will be updated um, within 10 years. So it's a 2020 to 2030 plan, but there will be a formal midterm evaluation review halfway through um, uh, to um, dictate any, any changes or any uh, add any additional technical information which has been gathered within the first five years. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that answer. I hope we have sufficiently answered that question. And I have another question. What does this plan mean for the average Barbadian? What does this mean? And I will get um, Ricardo to answer this question for me, please. All right, thank you, Alison. Um, so with the thrust of the incorporation of disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, we are basically moving in the direction of resilience, um, reducing the impact of hazards. So fundamentally the plan will be saving lives and protecting infrastructure. Uh, it is in addition to our toolkit which allows us to speak the universal economic language. So instead of coming to a developer and um, focusing on a setback line, we'll be looking at how you can best develop the property, protecting economic resources, but also understanding your exposure and seeking to implement that uh, in a cost efficient, seeking to reduce your, uh, your exposure in a cost efficient manage, manner. So what, what that will lead to then an operation during the operation of, let's say, a hotel. If there's a storm event, there'll be reduced damage firstly. And then secondly, there will be minimized disruption to the business. So development in the core should become more uh, resilient and uh, the economic shocks associated with hazards will be reduced. Um, therefore, Allowing you know, allowing the, the flow of economic benefits to the average person. Um, it, it's also looking at creative ways within the policy framework of the plan to fund uh, new coastal projects um, and involve the private sector. Uh, and we're also within the toolkit carefully assessing. So it's not replacing our our current thrust with anything but it's just adding this economic lens. So valuing our resources so that we can say, for example, this is the economic value of a beach space um, and we need to spend a certain amount of money to maintain it. So we have a compelling argument when we go to lobby uh, at the Ministry of Finance to improve and enhance beaches. Um, and also to the, the same thing with the corals. This is the economic value of corals and um, you know, this is how the, the general uh, society benefits from having healthy corals and we need to maintain them and we need to assign budget specifically for the protection of coastal resources. So yeah, that's the, the way in which having a plan like this allows measures to be implemented, which will definitely redound at the level of, of the average Barbadian. Alrighty, anybody wants to add anything to Ricardo's answer? Uh, Alison um, and Antonio here again. So yeah, I, I just wanted to, in short, say that it really speaks to being proactive, proactive in, in, in your development. Typically, you know, we would respond, we have the event, and then after you go in and say, what well, well, we will do this, or we will do that. But we actually moving away from that and actually building the resilience up front in the planning. So as, so as Ricardo said, it would, it would mean you could respond much more quickly to get about the business as usual. I think, I think that's one of the major, 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 how it really helps 
the, 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 the bottom of the street. All right. Thank you, Antonio, for your for your answer. Any other questions that anyone has? I just want to go back to the question about um, when the plan can be amended. And I have to refer specifically to our legislation, CAP 394, which explicitly states that, our, uh, that the plan can be amended at any time. Any time that the director thinks that the plan needs to be amended. And if you can see at section nine of our act, it states that the director may at any time prepare and propose for the approval of the minister draft amendments to the management plan. And at that same time, he can also prepare amendments to the order delimiting the coastal zone management area. So I know Jonathan talked about the mid-year that we can do it every five years, but at any time that the director thinks it's important for us to go back and look at an issue in the coastal zone management area, he can definitely do that. Of course, we have to go through the same process we have to go through the process that they the public inquiry again to make sure that our constituents understand what the amendments are about and to get their comments. But the director has the ability to amend the plan and the limits of the coastal zone management area at any time, um, any time he deems fit. So my question is, any more questions at all? from you or our lovely audience here this, this evening. If there are none, I think Jonathan has a poll that he wants to do at this point. I think there's a question from one of the members of the panel. It says, is the CZMU adequately resourced to deal with the new mandates resulting from the plan? Dr. Brewster, Antonia, are we adequately resourced to deal with this new mandate that we have um, on us? Mm. And he laughs. All right. <laughs> I have, well, you know how it goes. Um, I think th these are the sort of questions that will always come up. Uh, as far as we are concerned, at this present point in time, uh, to be honest, the answer to that would be no. I'm not going to pretend. Um, our mandate is forever expanding. And after every project cycle that we go through, new areas of, of um, competencies and requirements are, are thrust upon us. New avenues for exploration of the work that we have to do are also integrated into our ongoing work program. We don't run from the challenge, but at the same time, we have to face the fact that we understand the financial um, situations of, of, of the government as it stands right now. And therefore it is necessary to choose carefully the areas of activity that will be uh, more easily implemented than others and, and allow for time for us to, to be able to demonstrate how the other work that we will now be looking to roll out will be able to be implemented. This also speaks similarly to what Ricardo was talking about just now in terms of the ability to demonstrate um, the, the cost of having to do repair versus the cost of good engineering versus the cost of being proactive and preemptive as, as Antonio rightfully pointed out. So we have to take all that in stream. And on top of that, we also have to look at conditions and situations whereby if there, there are avenues for um, assisted monitoring, either through the use of things like citizen science, whereby uh, community organizations, NGOs, schools, uh, interested stakeholders and groups want to get involved in, in some aspects of monitoring that can be developed in a structured and formatted way that would be of assistance to us, then we would gratefully take part in that. If there's opportunities for the acquisition of, of oceanographic equipment that allows for autonomous monitoring so that you can have longer downtime uh, for the collection of data and the, and the automatic transfer either through satellite telemetry or or um, using the internet, et cetera, as a means of collecting data rather than having to go in the field, then that would give us more opportunity for other aspects to then roll out. 
obviously the greatest the greatest limitation that we will have is going to be staffing and it you know when the time comes for that battle to be fought we will try and put up as strong a fight as we can to get the increased staff that we will need to in, in, institute and implement some of these new activities that are coming on board um that's the reality at this present point in time though we are quite comfortable in what we are doing as best we can and we make the most of that uh thanks dr bruce perhaps ricardo can add hold a minute, hold a minute please ricardo can add something on financial resources because we are looking at new partnerships not just looking at the treasury for our sources of funding ricardo oh great Thank you, Alison. Um, yeah, so, um, well, we now have tools. We have a roadmap for valuing. So the economic lens is so important because we now can lobby for more resources based on an understanding of the benefit of what we do. So even as it relates to our water quality monitoring, our beach profile monitoring, what value does this bring on a national level? In terms of national development and how important is it um our investment in infrastructure works what is the value of this so we have in the pipeline 53 million dollars worth of, of work what is the benefit of implementing this uh in terms of avoided losses uh protecting jobs and infrastructure saving lives uh so we have that that new um tool in terms of the economic analysis will allow us to lobby more effectively uh, and show clearly the value for money investment um, in our initiatives. In, in addition to that, uh, when you look at new and creative uh, ways of funding projects and looking at involving the private sector, um, as you spoke about, Alison, uh, looking at the partnerships, um, understanding clearly the beneficiaries for the initiatives, and looking at how best they can be involved in, in assisting uh, with funding because once you start to measure these things carefully then people understand the benefit in contributing so that they can get the, the positive uh, return on investment thanks ricardo you have anything else to say um antonio to add to that no no i was actually going to go into the um the public private partnership bit of it that ricardo actually um spoke about just now so but he has already covered it, so I will step down, stand up. <laughs> okay, someone said that they law the CZMU on its efforts to develop the plan as effective coastal planning and management is critical to the development of our country and protection of our resources. However, how do we get past the usual pitfalls relating to the effective execution, adherence to, and enforcement of such plans this is a big question i tell you this is a very big question that we will have to answer can anyone on the panel um, speak to this question i will do it um i think that the the pitfalls are real and the pitfalls are inevitable but we stand as we have always done on science. And we're guided by science as a way forward to ensure that, as Fabian put it earlier, we, we try to show our competency in what we do and provide sufficient information that will help guide the process to the best uh, delivered product that we think can occur. I think that also speaks to what Ricardo was also uh, commenting on before, which is that now we have uh, good grounds to better try to defend and justify the, the resource allocations that we will be seeking into the future to see things achieved. As with most things, we are always left to the, the, the those that, that have the final decision to make those decisions. And um, we, we then have to deal with any outfall outcomes that happen along the way in that, in that matter. But, uh, we stand on science and we stand in the confidence of what we present and we are very comfortable with, with that sort of position. I must add that we are an advisory institution. Um, some people said, you know, the courts will give permission. We can't give permission for, for development. Our role is an advisory one. 
what is important is that the town planning act if you're looking at development permits the town planning Act says that it shall that um, when you're making this decision you shall have regard to the coastal zone management plan so the coastal zone management plan is just one consideration out of several in determining any application or any use that is going on around the coastal or along our coastline. But in our recommendation, as Dr. Bruce has said, we make sure that we stick to science. But there is sometimes, and having regard to the plan, there are extenuating circumstances that come up bits way more heavily than, than the plan. But we make our recommendation based on the science that we have at hand. I, I think, Alison, that point yes. that you also made is a good one because um, the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan can actually be seen as a subset of the PDP, right? In terms of it's a detailed plan for how the coastline can be better developed and managed uh, um, in that way. And therefore, it is important that when you're looking at how the overall country is developing and how a developer looks to apply some sort of uh, development activities within the within the framework of the PDP that you have to pay due regard, as you rightly said, to the outlined um, guidelines and standards and, and policies that fall within the coastal zone, the designated coastal zone management area, which, which is a subset of the PDP. Yeah, if you look closely at section eight of our act, it says that um, any person or authority exercising any function under this act uh, shall have regard to the management plan in terms of the conservation and management of coastal resources. So it's very clear. It's one of the important documents that you take in consideration when you're determining any activities that go along on the uh, within the coastal zone. Any other th issues that can be raised at this time? Someone mentioned. Um, is a suggestion that various coastal publics be utilized to brand the various areas with user-friendly language. Anyone wants to tackle this as a suggestion? Um, good suggestion, my, mind you, very good suggestion on the part of the author. And you're having your answer um, someone is going to answer this for you. Um, I, I think there was also. Sorry, Leah. No, I was just going to say that I also thought there was a question earlier up about the enhanced awareness and rollout for yes. for the information information for the plan, and I think that that's something that is it is growing on us. Well, not growing on us. It is something that we always <laughs> try to do in terms of how we roll out our activities. Um, and as you can see from the approach that has been taken for the, the rollout of this plan, we have tried to use just about every means possible to make outreach, to gather people to come in, to pay attention. And uh, we've used different social media platforms and we've tried to be engaging through the use of, of animation and uh, other, other forms to get a message out there. And I think it has been working uh, very well for, for, for us. It's been a long time since we've done this sort of thing. Uh, we had done some things, well, not to this scale, but somewhat similar for the 1998 plan when we'd actually gone out and done a lot more face-to-face -face interaction to roll out the plan. Um, but obviously because of COVID, it helped it, that literally curtailed a lot of the sort of one-on-one -on -one type activities that we could have done with social groups, et cetera. So, this approach now is, is the way forward. And um, we have to continue this sort of being into the future. And it, it is something that we are strongly looking at um, to roll out um, in the months ahead, because we have to ensure that this level of informed um, dis information dissemination continues. Thank you very much, Leo. I don't see any more questions. Um on the question and answer session. I thank you very much for a very interactive session here this evening. Absolutely lovely, the questions were great. We had good challenges to us in terms of providing the answers, but we certainly encourage you that if you have any more questions, please do not hesitate to email us. 
We have a WhatsApp number as well that you can send us your question. You can um, contact any one of us at the Coastal Zone Management Unit, and we are willing and able to answer your questions on this plan. At this point in time, Jonathan has a final poll that he wants to share with you. Please, please answer these questions at this time. Jonathan, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Alison. And to wrap up this very uh, interesting evening, we are just trying to capture everybody's view on what you've learned so far and your perspectives on the plan. So you'll see on the screen, hopefully, a um, two last questions. First question is, how highly would you rate the intentions of the updated ICZM plan? You have a various various options there, knowing that the message of this revised plan is uh, a new, innovative, risk resilient ICZM plan. You've heard it in the various presentations and questions that there's a particular focus on science, data, and basically an appreciation of new climate change information, which is being inculcated into development planning on the, on the coast. So your responses to that would be very interesting. Um, the team will compile um, the remaining people that are on the, on the call. Uh, we'll get that result and then we'll lead on to the final question. And we're pleased to see that there's a, a very positive response with regard to the um, intentions of this new risk resilient plan, ranging from, on the whole, very good to excellent. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, our final question is relating to um, the updated ICZM plans, policies and proposed actions make me feel more confident that future management of this sub area will be more resilient to climate change and disasters in the future. Do you agree? or disagree with that statement. So the statement is, the, the, from the various presentations and the, the message that you've heard, with regards to these new policies and actions proposed at the management policy level, would you feel more confident that future management of activities within the sub area will be more resilient to climate change and disasters in the future? This will be an interesting uh, observation because there's been various discussions as to how this will be implemented, the cost of this. And once we get this, this message right and we have the confidence of the stakeholders, um, CZMU will be able to move this forward with, uh, with confidence into the coming years. And the results are quite dictating that a good 83% 80, of everybody is saying that they agree or strongly agree that our communities will feel um, better managed from a, from a resiliency perspective. So that's great news. Um, for now, I wanna say thank you and I'll pass back to Alison for the final wrap ups. Thank you. Um, going forward, we have the next meeting is, <coughs> excuse me, please, is concept B to the choice and this is on Monday, June the 14th at 6 p.m. And then on Thursday, the 17th, we have the choice to North Point. So if you're interested in those two sub areas, um, please join us at 6 p.m. on Monday, June the 14th and Thursday, June the 17th at 6 p.m. as well. So that is next week, we cover um, sub area three and four uh, next week. So don't forget to join us at 6 p.m. At this point in time, Antonio will give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Alison. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have really now come to the close of this public inquiry process for the Siberia, Siberia 2, Kittridge Point 2, Concept Bay. And uh, we really like to thank you for your participation in this, in this, in this process and, and hope that the information that you received tonight gives you a better understanding and appreciation for how we see the draft ICZM plan aiding in, sus in the sustainable development, not just of the course, but your sub area specifically. 
If you have any further inquiries, you can send them to us through our website at www.coastal.gov.bb or you can uh, WhatsApp us at the number 2563173. At this point, I wish to thank you all for coming. I wish you good night and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Antonio. There's an exit poll as well. Please do this exit poll as soon as this session ends. Thank you very much and have a good night.